Let's pray and jump into our Bible study. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for the wisdom that is in it and for your teaching and for your counsel. And I do ask, Lord, that your will and what you have revealed through it and, Lord, what you have for us specifically will be seen and known by us here today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges chapter 3. I um, just want to read a couple verses. We're not going to get too far into this. I was really hoping we'd get into like one of my favorite Bible stories ever. But we're really not going to make it that far this week. We'll get to it next time. But just want to look at a couple of verses starting at verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. There's that cycle. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. There's a complicated relationship dynamic at play between Yahweh and Israel. You know, it's different. They're a unique people, and God has a unique relationship with them. They were special to him because he initiated their being by calling one man and giving him a, a special covenant, a man named Abraham. And Abraham became the grandfather of the man who was renamed from Jacob, which means tripper-upper or heel catcher, to Israel, prince with God. And Jacob became the father of the sons that went on to become the 12 tribes of Israel. And he gave them a special calling that came with unique promises. And their existence and their story and the history that is here serves as a great picture, a lesson for us, for it exemplifies how amazing the gospel is as we look back and see the system that they had to operate under as God had instructed them and led them and made deals with them. Basically, if they would serve him and obey him, then he in turn would bless them. And they would know his provision. They would know his strength and victory. They would know his generosity as they acquired land and cities that were already productive. They, they would know these things about God if they would first obey all of the commandments that God had given them. Their ability to possess God's blessings and God's presence and even God's redemption from times of hardship and difficulty were fully dependent upon them as a nation to first reach out to God. And in different ways. First of all, in obedience. If they reached out to God in obedience, God would fulfill these promises. But also they needed to reach out to him at times in repentance. And we see the Lord responding to that over and over again. And we see that in Judges, a, a, a desperate cry for deliverance. And God would respond to these cries, not necessarily because of their covenant with him, but because of his covenant with them. Remember, he said, I will not break my covenant with you. It is the people that would break their covenant with God over and and over again. And so he told them he wouldn't break his covenant. And here's, here's what it looked like time and time again when his people broke that covenant. It started with a lack of leadership. You know, the, the judge died, and the people did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Visible accountability, authority was removed from their presence, and suddenly they, they shifted into compromise. It's hard to say what their spiritual life as a nation looked like under the rule of the judges. Some cases give us more of a glimpse than others, but for the most part, we see that God just gave them seasons of peace, and there were probably more of an issue of good leadership and morale and military strength than they were necessarily spiritual revival. For the moment that leader was gone, they instantly fell again into compromise and then into oppression then eventually into that place where they cried out again for deliverance. It wasn't just a matter of a few isolated people who practiced compromise and to complete and utter disobedience to the Lord. 
It wasn't just a few people who were abandoning the worship of Yahweh and giving themselves over to false gods. The sins of this nation were time and time again overwhelming. If there was a remnant, it was small, it was off the radar for this nation, gave itself over completely time and time again. And in all of this, God was faithful. Time and time again, his covenant with them, he was faithful to them. And he responded to three things. He responded to their disobedience by bringing discipline and correction upon them. And he responded to their despair when they would cry out by bringing deliverance to them. And in those times of deliverance, God responded to their faith by giving them victory. He was faithful to respond to disobedience, to despair, and to faith. I believe that God is still faithful to respond. Even though our relationship with him isn't as complicated or difficult on our part as Israel's relationship was with him. They were to represent his kingdom here on earth, and he was their king, and they were to live as a nation subject to his rule and to his decrees. And, and here's the deal that God had with his children. It's outlined in many places throughout the Pentateuch, but in Deuteronomy 28, we, we get it clearly. Verses 1 and 2, and if you faithfully obey the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, Yahweh your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Yahweh your God. Now from here it goes on to describe all the amazingly wonderful things that God was going to do for them in response to their obedience to him. And then in verse 15 of chapter 28 in Deuteronomy, he says, but if you will not obey, Here's the other side of that coin. And this is God's promise. This is part of his covenant with them. Remember he said, I will not break my covenant with you. This is part of that covenant where we see God being faithful. If you will not obey the voice of Yahweh your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. As long as they obeyed their part in the physical kingdom that God had them in, he would respond and he would bless their physical kingdom by giving them physical victories over physical enemies and by giving them physical land which would produce for them physical produce. God would bless them in that way. Our relationship is different because that physical kingdom, that physical world, it's, it's so frail, it's so broken. It's so human dependent. And that physical kingdom, I believe it's been promoted significantly for us. He is still the king, and we who are believers are subjects to his rule. And there is still a kingdom that he is, is over, but now it's not a matter of us earning his favor based on our performance to obey. We are now recipients of an obedience far greater than anything we could ever give or do. Jesus obeyed completely. He won God's favor on our behalf. And as a result, those of us who have embraced his forgiveness and those of us who have proclaimed him as Lord, we've been born anew, not into this physical kingdom, but into his spiritual kingdom. Our citizenship to this physical world is secondary at best. It is not our top priority. As Christians, we have the right to vote and influence our physical kingdom if indeed we're actually those who live in a democratic physical kingdom. Many Christians don't. Some live under oppressive dictators, some under communism, some under socialism, some under Sharia law. Some live in the midst of anarchy and military rule and, and coups and nations at war and under attack. Some Christians live in places where their faith is utterly despised and hated and even in places where it's illegal and they are physically persecuted and oppressed and they have no influence upon their government and their government is completely opposed to the ways of God and there they are as Christians living in that physical kingdom. And when we were in India this last time, a lot of our pastors after the conference 
where we taught them, walked a few miles down to this bus stop. And as they were waiting at this bus stop, certain members of this political party showed up and were there and were seen. And these guys left. They came back. They missed their bus because they didn't want to get beat up for being Christians. They had been spied out. They had been identified. We had to buy them new bus tickets so they could get home safely. The beauty of this spiritual kingdom is this. We are all united under one king. Those guys in India, the believers in China, believers suffering under great oppression and persecution in the Middle East, those of us living our cushy Christianity lives here in America, we, we all have one king. And we're not dependent upon the spiritual obedience of our physical kingdom as a whole. As Americans... We can't think that we have some form of spiritual upper hand over believers in, let's say, China, simply because our founders were influenced by the traditions of Christianity and they live under a purely atheistic government. From the testimonies I hear, of the things I've read, the, the church in China under an oppressive atheistic government is thriving. The church in America might be heavily populated, but what we have is not the same. Yeah, I don't buy tomatoes in the grocery store because they don't taste like tomatoes. Have you noticed that? The consistency is not right. The color is not right. I mean, you, you just cut them and they're, they're just like tasteless mush. But if you get a tomato that you grew out in the sun, in your garden, out there in the elements, in real dirt, in the ground, I mean, for some reason, that tomato tastes pretty good, doesn't it? different. And so you have these hothouse tomatoes that are grown in mass production. A lot of them are picked green and chemicals are sprayed on them so they actually turn red. And then they put them on the shelf at Giant and we buy them and slice them up and pretend that they taste like something on our salad. I think the church in America is kind of like hothouse tomatoes. You know, there's a lot of them. We're mass produced. We're high in numbers, but we're growing up in this greenhouse of protection. And we're having these false ideas of what spiritual growth is sprayed upon us. And we're just so comfortable. I think it's different in other places where there's real persecution. And it's not that we should feel bad or seek out persecution. That'd be kind of dumb. But I think our circumstances are different. And I'm glad that we are part of a kingdom that is not fully dependent upon America. I'm glad we're part of a kingdom that is dependent upon the believers, universal, throughout this world. We're one family. The introduction to this message is actually influenced by current events. And usually I don't do that. I don't give Father's Day messages. Every day is Father's Day. I don't, I don't do current events. But our government, which is wholly secular and physical, has done something which is contrary to our biblical definitions of truth. And our government is worldly and they are doing worldly things. And the church is upset about it. I've seen it on the Facebook. And quite honestly, you know, it's about as shocking as a duck quacking. I mean, is everyone getting upset about that? I can't believe it. The ducks quacked. They ate bread. I'm so shocked. But since we live here, and since the things of this physical kingdom influence us, and since we're called to obey our governing authorities, Paul has laid that out. You should have seen the kingdom, physical kingdom he lived under. And he told us we need to obey our governing authorities. And so we're concerned. We do care. It does matter to us. But we cannot forget this physical kingdom is not our kingdom. It's secondary or, or what's the next one? I would say third dairy <laughs> at best. The concerns of the spiritual kingdom are focused more intently upon what God's will is for people that he loves. He so 
loved the world and those in the world. And it's his will that none should perish, but that all would come to know him. And we need to be very careful to make sure that our outcry or our outrage over the physical kingdom, and we have the right to have outcry and outrage and to agree or disagree publicly. We totally have that right to do it. But we need to make sure that it does not hinder our call to love, not affirm, but love people and show them the way into God's spiritual kingdom. And yet God is unchanging. He is still faithful to hold up his end of the deal. He was faithful to Israel as a physical kingdom. And that faithfulness, it extends to us. God will still be faithful. God will still respond. He'll respond to our disobedience. He'll respond to our despair. And he'll respond to our faith. And today we're going to talk about the first point of these three. We're going to talk about how the Lord responds so faithfully to the disobedience of his people. And let's look again at verse 12 and 13. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. First off, God takes credit for giving strength to the enemy of his children. God takes credit for giving strength to a nation of heathens who practiced a religion that killed the babies. God claimed to strengthen them and to use them. God strengthened outside worldly forces to bring discipline upon his people. It's kind of a system we see being played out throughout the Old Testament. And some would say, you know, Lord, you know, why is it that these nations get your strength and your victory when they're evil? And the Lord would say, I'll take care of them. When the ten tribes of Israel were hauled off into captivity and not heard from again, those nations which hauled them off, the Lord said, they'll get their due. But for now, I'm using them. You know, last week we talked about God repurposing the remnants of Israel's disbelief. And that's exactly what is happening here. These nations were not destroyed. These nations were not continually opposed as they, as they were supposed to be. And God took them into his hands and he used them for his purposes to bring upon his people the consequences of their disobedience. And this faithfulness, it still exists for his children today. The Lord has established this thing called consequences. And he uses them. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that, one, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. And the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God grants us forgiveness. And we continue to walk in the favor of Jesus before him. And that is cool. He continually looks upon us and extends his favor for Jesus to us. He extends what he sees as being holy in Jesus to us. He extends what he sees as being righteous in Jesus to us. He does that. Even as we continually in our flesh mess up. Even if in our mind we have thoughts of pride or lust or hate. Our weakness and our inability to walk in physical perfection as Jesus did is not a license to resign ourselves just to sin freely. Well, I guess I'm, I guess I'm weak and broken, so I guess that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to resign myself to that. Yes, God is continually and opulently gracious to us, but He does not withhold physical consequences. To those who would say, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do because I'm weak. And because I can't be perfect, so I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. Paul says God will not be mocked. If you sow to that, you will reap from that. There will be consequences. God is 
faithful to respond to disobedience. And if we suffer the physical consequences of our sin, we may become less effective to fulfill the calling that he's given us. There's a purpose here. Let's talk about the context of Galatians 6 for a moment. Because it doesn't involve just one person sinning. It involves the community that that person is in. This is a call for believers to be attentive to and compassionate towards those who are falling into sin in the midst of their community. That is their church, their gathering, that place where they assemble to learn and to grow and to be family. Verse 1 says, if you are spiritual, go in gentleness. Because if you don't go in gentleness, you're not spiritual, and you should have stopped. If you are spiritual, go in gentleness to the one who has fallen and seek to restore them. In the process, make sure that you don't become the one who ends up falling. Help to bear the burden of those in the family of faith who are struggling. Why? Because this is the law of Christ. We're not under the law. Well, here's the law you are under. You need to love people around you and bear their burdens and go to them in humility, cautiously, seeking to restore. In all of this, we are to be attentive to our own humility. If we are prideful, then our focus and our perspective and our priorities will be off. Sometimes we want to go tell people they're sinners and they're in the wrong just so that we can feel better about how right we are. Because it's good to feel I mean, it feels good to be right, doesn't it? We like that. To ensure that we don't become those who fall, verse 1 tells us to keep watch on ourselves. As we restore others, be careful personally as we wade into the world of sin and temptation that has entrapped our brother and our sister. As we wade into that world where they are, to take them and bring them back gently and compassionately in humility, we need to keep watch on ourselves so that we also are not tempted and we don't fall as that person has fallen, as we become exposed to their sin. It might open the door of temptation for us to sin. And then verse 3 calls us to humility, for pride deceives us. You ever wonder why people can't see things the way you see them? It's either because you're prideful and you're deceived, or they're prideful and they're deceived. Because pride deceives us. It causes us to see things certain ways and we're just so full of ourself and, and, and us being right and our ways being true and, and we're just all puffed up. We're deceived. Verse 6 calls those of us who benefit from what we've learned to share it with the ones who've taught us. That is, we would contribute in service and in prayer and in generosity to the ongoing work of teaching and equipping, investing here so that that we can do the maintenance work of building one another up so they will not go off and fall into sin. Verse 7 and 8 tells us of God's faithfulness to respond to our disobedience. Yes, if we are disobedient, we will reap consequences. However, if we press on, not growing weary to do good, verse 9 tells us that we will reap rewards. Just continue to press on. Continue to push forward. Continue investing yourself and serving and loving and being faithful. Not looking for your rewards in people, but looking for your rewards in the God who blesses, the God who is glorified in what you do. And finally, the ultimate call in verse 10, do good to everyone. But there's this little caveat there. Primarily, first and foremost. Do good to everyone, but there's a primary, there's there's a priority there. First and foremost, do good to one another in the church. Do good to all, but start here. Start with your fellow believers. Help to invest and strengthen and build up each other and then go out and do good out there. God wants us to be in a place where we won't need to suffer the consequences of our sin. To help us be in that place, He's given us our family of fellow believers, these people that we gather with. He wants us to do good things for one another. He wants us to 
be generous unto one another. He wants us to serve one another and love one another. He wants us to do good for all as we have the opportunity, but first and foremost that we would practice that goodness with our fellow believers. And when someone does fall, that we wouldn't be those who step out of humility and into pride, but rather we would be those who in humility would seek to compassionately restore our fallen brother and sister. Fallen Christians will not benefit from criticism and judgment. It just doesn't work. When that brother or sister of yours has fallen, to criticize them, to judge them, to come in a tone of condemnation, there's no benefit in that. It's not God's model. It's, it's against the law. It says right here what the law is for us. To go in gentleness and in love. This is the law of Christ. Fallen Christians will not benefit from that. This process might make us feel more spiritual and thus validate that we are actually being prideful, which means that we are not seeing things clearly. Fallen Christians need to benefit, though, from our love and from our compassion because God will not be mocked. He will respond to our sin. He is faithful to do so because He loves us. And He wants to motivate us to love one another. Verse 13 of Judges chapter 3 says, He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel and they took possession of the city of Palms. Now God gave strength to one enemy and that enemy found others to join him. You've heard that phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I mean, they might not be friends, until they were joined together with a common enemy. As Israel is now, Israel was back then, they were outnumbered and surrounded by nations that were out to destroy them. Nothing brings people together in unity like a common enemy. Later in the study of Judges, we'll come to the story of Gideon. He was severely outnumbered, and the Lord said, you know, I'm with you. And he's like, okay, Lord, but... Can you just give me some assurance? And so, after being repeatedly assured by the Lord, he defeated the enemy, and the odds were ridiculous. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 6 where the king of Syria gathered his army around the house of Elisha the prophet. You know, the king of Israel just kept eluding him. It's as if the king of Israel knew what the king of Syria was going to do. And, and the king of Syria is speaking to his advisors and he's saying, there's a spy here. Someone is letting that king of Israel know what we're doing because he always knows how to respond to every move we make. And the advisor said, it's Elisha the prophet. He tells the king of Israel things that you say secretly in your bedchamber. How does he do that? He's a prophet of God. And so he's like, we need to get him. We need to get that guy. The supernatural spy. Didn't know Elisha was a spy, did you? So the king of Syria's army surrounded his house, and Elisha's servant woke up one morning, and he went outside, and he looked, and their little house was surrounded by an army. And he came back in, scared, freaked out. Master, what should we do? And Elisha's so cool. He's like, it's okay. It's all right. He replied in verse 16, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant would have said, Okay, I see like hundreds of guys, but right here I see two. Two. Two against a lot. Now, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And so God opened the eyes of the servant to see this army of angels that was surrounding the Syrians. But they didn't destroy the enemy. Elijah had another plan. I mean, they were ready. But Elijah said, Lord, blind them instead. Make them all to be blind and confused. And, and so they were all stumbling in blindness. And he came out and he said, I, you're in the wrong place. 
but I will lead you to the right place. And, and, and in their blindness, in their confusion, they were led by Elisha, and they came to, they came to the place where the Israeli army was and the king of Israel was, and their eyes were opened, and suddenly they said, Whoa, now we're surrounded. And the king said, What should I do? Should I destroy them? And Elisha says, No, feed them. Treat them well. And then send them back. They've seen the power of God. And from that point forward, they never had problems again with the Syrians. They were shown that our God is great. They were shown that our God is gracious. They were shown that our God is love and that our God can change them. 1 John chapter 4 Verse 4 says, For he who is with you is greater than he who is in the world. It goes on to say of those who deny Jesus, God the Son, who came in the flesh, that they are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. From here... The call turns to love. He said, let us love one another. For this is what is from God. This is what is indicative to the law of Christ. That we would love one another. There are two more parts to this message. Yes, God faithfully responds to our disobedience. But when we continue, we'll see that God faithfully responds to our despair. And God faithfully responds response to our faith. I'd fully intended to hit all three points today and to get into this awesome story of Ehud killing Eglon. It's a cool story. In part one, as I studied, I discovered this beautiful message of the Christian's call to take care of one another. And we are a family here, in this place, united as members of a greater kingdom, spread out all over the world. We might live under physical kingdoms which are sinful and which are opposed to the ways of God, but significantly greater than that is our call to be faithful members of God's kingdom, showing love and concern for one another, seeking in humility to restore those who, because they are broken, have fallen. We do this with caution and with humility, to make sure that we are tempted and we do not fall. We do this as ones who are called to compassion, generosity, and love to our community, and those who are called to do good to all, but especially to one another. We all know the consequences of our sins and failures. We know them. We've experienced them. Sometimes we carry them with us for the rest of our lives. God will not be mocked. He will respond and we will know that what what we will know that his back is not turned on us. He will assure us of his presence. And when this happens, I pray that we will be surrounded by humble and gentle saints who are seeking to restore us. So today I want to challenge you with this. Has your brother or your sister fallen? And did you judge them or condemn them? Did you just say, I'm washing my hands of you. I can't believe you would do such a thing. I'm done with you. Did your actions do more to push them away or to draw them back in? And I ask you, because I've been there. And I'm sure I'll be there again. I've done this. I've behaved poorly with people who have fallen. It's not uncommon for us to do it. So I would ask today, if you know of a situation and if God is bringing someone to mind that you would step forward and that you would seek that person out in humility and attempt to restore them. If someone is on your heart, if someone is on your mind. Like-